On Mondays, we generally check and see what the analytics of the class are, meaning how many people watch and from where. And uh, last week, um, there were people from 15 different states and one other country, Britain, who watched <laughs> this. And welcome. Yeah. Whoever you are, wherever you are. Uh, the theme, as you know, that we are using, uh, Paradox and Contradiction, I said last week you'll be seeing these two icons as a way to brand what we are trying to do. And I'm glad for those of you who are here, this is our second Sunday back live, and God, it's good to see you. <laughs> so no matter who you are, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, You're you are welcome right. here. So one of the fascinations I have had ever since I was an adolescent has been about learning the origin of different phrases and idioms that we use in the English language. Part of this is because my mother was a high school senior English teacher. <laughs> and she used to play a game with me called uh, What Word Has the Most Meanings? And I'd have to go to the dictionary and look it up, and we'd have kind of a competition. I now realize that was her way to get me out of her hair. Yes, absolutely. All right? But we also had this thing about the origin of phrases. Uh, and I've just been fascinated by this for years and years and years. And I've got a whole shelf of books at home about origins of idioms and phrases <laughs> in the English language. Like, how many of you have in the place where you live a living room? Everybody, practically, has a living room. So do you know uh, why we call it that? This is a Museum of Natural History in Washington. It's a example Roddy of the first. Roddy has an answer. Uh, uh, well, Roddy has an answer to your question. Roddy, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I want to tell this. We um, love, I love you, Roddy. We'll, we'll deal with so that later. So the, the living room is, is actually a contribution of American architects. Because up until a certain thing happened in American history, this room was called the parlor. Yeah. Uh, the par uh, word parlor comes into the English language in about the 16th century from the French. The word parlor means to talk. So the parlor was a place where people went in their homes to talk. And, of course, the parlor was also used for another inevitable event, and that was to hold funerals. So usually uh, before the funeral industry came into being, a body was washed and laid out in a casket, in a coffin, not a casket, uh, and put in the parlor. Well, when the funeral industry began to come into reality, they started establishment called, with undertakers. Undertakers are called undertakers because they undertake what no one else wants to do. That's where that word comes from. And as they move the uh, funeral business into their own establishments, they call those places funeral parlors. So they took the parlor out of the house, and American architects were left with, what are we going to call this room? Well, it's no longer the dying room, so we'll call it the living room. And that's why we call the living room the living room. So there is another phrase I'm sure everybody's heard, and that's letting the cat out of the bag. Roddy says you got that part right. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> there are a couple of phrases in the English language, like this one, that we don't know where it came from. It's in uh, some correspondence about Shakespeare, and there are two prominent theories about why letting the cat out of the bag came into the English language. None of them are, neither one of them is correct. Uh, there's a phrase I'm sure also you've all heard called the whole nine yards. There are maybe 15 different explanations for why we use that phrase, and nobody knows where the whole nine yards came from. So nobody knows where letting the cat out of the bag came from. Two prominent theories, neither of which is correct. But everybody knows what it means. Hmm. It means letting a secret out, revealing something that nobody knows, maybe uh, revealing an in-joke 
for somebody who's not in on the joke, or maybe you tell the plot of a movie before somebody really wants to know what the the um, plot twist is. So. Um, The, the, we're using this title today because we're calling what we want to do spiritual practice. It's not what you think. And it's not what you think it is. Though we're going to end up saying what you think it is. <laughs> now letting the cat out of the bag about spiritual practice no longer being what you think it is. Yeah. It may not be what you think at all. Well, you know, one of the things, you know, there's a phrase we also use in our parlance with each other uh, that is sort of one of the really stupid phrases. You've, you've heard it. Maybe you've even used it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Promise me you won't get mad. Oh, I might not. You can't make that promise. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I'm going to tell you something. Promise me you won't shut down. Huh. We're going to talk about spiritual practice. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been thinking about the idea that there is a developmental aspect to our spiritual practice. Um, you know, you said earlier and also in our podcast this week that spiritual practice is evolutionary. In other words, our spiritual practice grows as our understanding of the evolutionary process grows. And I think part of this is, you know, we're engaging with, deep time evolution. We're engaging with knowledge about science and the universe that we've not had before. And so our spiritual practice, I believe, needs to be relevant and responsive to these new understandings. So we can't continue sacrificing the proverbial virgin. Hmm, there we go. There you go. To the volcano. You know, this was a old practice and the caption says, Serves her right. She was always going on about women not being allowed to be involved in the services. <laughs> dark, dark. Um, and my husband says, well, we wouldn't keep an outhouse in the back just as a relic to how we used to go to the bathroom. I think most of us prefer indoor plumbing if it's available. So our spiritual practice needs indoor plumbing too. It grows. It evolves. And it relates to our individual development. My kids, who are all under 12, ask some really cool questions and say some really wild things. One of my sons knows so much about the expanding multiverse that I feel like I learn something new from him every day. I kind of blame him for why I'm doing this PhD in the first place. <laughs> but my youngest son the other day said, super casually, Mommy, in my dream the other night, I was talking to one of my ancestors, who was an elephant caregiver in Africa. I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's really cool. And I didn't shut it down. I didn't say, no, that's not true. I just thought it was cool. I was talking to one of my ancestors in my dreams last night. So they're getting older, but they still think mostly in dualistic terms. They're just not in that sort of gray area yet, but they're learning. I read something the other day that made complete sense to me. I follow this blog and uh, website called The Door of Perception. It's a youngest guy who writes, a, he's fascinated by the evolution of consciousness, our interaction with the natural world, and human ritual. So he kind of follows these cool threads in a lot of different topics. In this particular post, he wrote, for children, the close-up view is much more natural than the distant view. The glittering dew pearls on the leaf edge of the lady's mantle attract attention, not the view over valleys and mountains. Both views, however, contain the entire universe. When we're young, our worlds are small. They're active and they're so interesting. If you've been around a young child recently, you know that a young child will point things out to you that you just can walk through and not pay attention to. Um, the other day, I was walking home from school with my middle son and our resident five-year-old, Haley, and she goes, oh, Holly, a roly-poly. You know what those are, right? The little doodle bugs is what I called them growing up. I missed it entirely because my mind was on the big, on other things. I don't know what I was thinking about, but I wasn't looking at the ground, looking for roly-polies. 
but I loved those as a child. Uh, Sesame Street, I remember Ernie had this little doodle bug garden. And he'd go inside the doodle bug garden and the doodle bugs had this whole other life that they had and he would sort of take us into that, that imaginary doodle bug garden. It was, um, it was my favorite part of Sesame Street. But when I was little, I used to lay flat on the ground and watch these little guys for hours. I loved how they rolled up into a ball. I would collect them and put them in a jar. And I remember that the only time I ever got in trouble with my beloved granny, my, my father's mother, was when I used one of her good forks for poking holes into a jar so that the doodle bugs could breathe. <laughs> she, she didn't say, don't do that. She said, don't use the good forks. I don't know what she gave me instead, but it wasn't the good fork. So it makes sense to me. Our life begins blind inside the mother's womb. When we are born, our sight is still, if we are born with seeing, we, our sight is quite limited. Our caregiver's face doesn't even come into focus until about eight or nine weeks old. And that close-up face is our first orientation to the world more than anything else. We read that expression first. Not the stars, not the clouds, not even the roly-polies at this point orient us to our world. So our field of vision expands as our consciousness expands, as our developmental world expands. And this early childlike way of seeing is uh, what is near and immediate is called, could be called the vita activa, which is the active life. Whereas later in life, as we grow old <laughs> and learn to sort of contemplate the large, this is the more contemplative way of life called the vita contem contemplativa, the contemplative life. We get older, we have a tendency to find quiet in what is far away and vast. For me, it is the mountains. I love being in the mountains because they're, they're just so, so, <laughs> they're just so peaceful. It's a shift in a way from the very active sympathetic nervous system that's always responding to the environment to the parasympathetic nervous system which calms us down. This is the first cat to let out of the bag. What is far away awakens what is within. The big becomes small and the small contains the entire universe. There are, of course, these are just words, metaphors that we are using to try and explain something that really doesn't have words to it. Uh, you know, words just help us share our experiences. But if we were to say, look to someone, to a mountain range, we might both have different experiences of it, but we're sharing it. Words help us put that into practice. So Meister Eckhart, who we've both been reading, he once wrote, about the caterpillar. If I were to gaze at a caterpillar, I would never have to write another sermon. The small becomes big. So here's a sort of practice you can try in your spiritual practice, is gazing out at the stars. You'll experience them gazing back upon you in the same way that you are gazing at the caterpillar. There's this kind of wonderful loop of perception between the caterpillar the meditative mind, and then the wider cosmos. The big becomes small, the small becomes big. Our own smallness is, of course, illustrated by the fact that not even all of our own thoughts are accessible to us. We have thoughts that live outside of ourselves that come to us only when we experience the world outside of ourselves. And spiritual practice, as we're saying, is not what you think, but how you see. So, um, Ken Wilbur, mm. whom I openly confess writes stuff that is almost always over my head. I, I, I love his integrative philosophy and his developmental model for growing. Uh, I've read some of his things. Um, he um, wrote a piece on spiral dynamics um, and what was going on with the virus and our country and other things. He's a very insightful guy. And um, I read somewhere, some, and it, what, what I'm about to share with you is so easy to understand because he has a way of conceptualizing phases of spiritual growth. And I would like to introduce you to them now 
because this is another way to think differently about what spiritual practice is. So um, Ken Wilber says that um, there are four stages of spiritual growth, which he calls cleaning up, growing up, waking up, and showing up. Now, when the church has focused on cleaning up, it is almost always focused on the purity code of the current church era. So for me, in growing up in Tennessee, it was don't drink, don't smoke, don't dance, or go with anybody who does. <laughs> that was the purity code. And you were supposed to keep yourself clean in, in that way. Um, what I think cleaning up means is um, doing whatever first half of life maturity we have to do that actually enables us to show up in the real much bigger world than most people seem to be able to do. And one of the resources that I would offer you for consideration here, and it's one that we mentioned a lot during the time that we were live streaming only, is uh, Jim Hollis's book, Living the Examined Life. Mm -hmm. And if you want something that you can use as a daily spiritual guide, this book of 21 brief chapters, you can read every chapter in less than 10 minutes. Don't read more than one a day. Read the book, make notes on it, and then start it all over again. It's a wonderful, wonderful resource. When it comes to growing up, the good news and the bad news is that we still have a long way to go, all of us. And I know that that's true for me, so I'm assuming that's true for you too, that I'm not there, and i got a long way to go. I'm always, as Holly was just talking about learning something from her children, learning things that I had never seen before, and that's so exciting, and it's also so humiliating. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I would warn you about having a daily spiritual practice. It's humiliating. You will find if you take up a sitting practice how difficult it is, and you will want to quit. And I urge you not to do that, to keep at it and, and to keep growing. Now, there are two books that we have mentioned over the last 15 months, both by Dharmud Amiraku. One is called Adult Faith, and the other is called When the Disciple Comes of Age. Both are good resources. Now, so far in the last five minutes, I've mentioned three books. <laughs> okay? You know that I do that right. a lot. He reads like 28 books a week. I read two. So um, <laughs> next week, I'm going to dialogue with Dr. Jim Bankson here. And then the following week, we're going to come back and talk about something that I learned new from Meister Eckhart yeah. this past two weeks oh, that yeah. was just so wonderful to yeah. see. Anyway, the three books I've mentioned... Um, we'll be having a test over those in two weeks. Yeah. The list is on the website. Yeah, is it? Yeah. All right. And depending on how you do, we'll determine whether you go to heaven or not. No what? No one. No one will come in person. No one in person. We'll be uh, back virtual that week. Where the. <laughs> I'm, I'm just yeah. jesting. <laughs> So we all grow up in our own bubbles, and we live in our own bubbles. And, and indeed, precisely at this moment, we're living in our bubble. And uh, one of the Buddhist journals I take, Dharma, uh, Buddha Dharma, has an excellent article, which I want to try to reprise in here sometime, about how we cannot see the bubble that we're in. Hmm. And that's why we need a community of people to help us see what we cannot see. So these bubbles strengthen us as we grow up, but they also limit us. Uh, and and they, they keep us from seeing how much of our shadow self we have still to face and to integrate. Waking up is the ongoing experience of overcoming the experience of ourselves as separate from being itself. I'm going to say that again. Waking up is the ongoing experience of overcoming the experience of seeing ourselves as separate from being itself. We're connected to everything that is and to all who are.
Now to me, this is the goal of all spiritual work, including being here. This is part of your spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And it's a part of what religious services or rituals we may engage in, whether across the plaza, whether you do individual rituals or collective rituals, um, whatever practice you have. Waking up is not achieving some sort of protection. It's what the, the mystics refer to as surrendering to divine love or being able to enter the darkness of the cave that, that, that mm -hmm. Holly has talked mm -hmm. about. And then the last phrase in uh, Wilbur's scheme, showing up, means a couple of things. First of all, it means training ourselves in awareness and presence. Showing up also means bringing our heads and hearts and hands into the actual suffering, hurting places of this world. So you could call this engaged spirituality. It's spirituality that sees the injustices and inequalities and knows that there is a call on the part of evolutionary cosmology, the evolutionary process, to address these things. That we are responsible now because in our evolutionary process, we are the cosmos itself having developed the capacity to reflect back upon itself. That's what, that's what we homo sapiens can do. Mm. So <clears throat> here's the paradox and the contradiction. Though there is a way to walk, it is a pathless way. There is a letting go of everything we think we have to have and have to hold on to in order to, in, that we need to hold on to give meaning to our lives. We have to let that go. Let's say that again. <laughs> There's a letting go of everything we think we have to have in order to hold on to what gives meaning to our lives. Now, if that sounds intangible, it's because it is. It's a pathless path. <laughs> so I recently started subscribing to this digital and print publication called Nautilus. Anyone familiar with it? It's a really cool and very beautiful publication with incredible graphics. It bills itself as a different kind of science magazine that delivers deep, undiluted narrative storytelling to bring science into the largest and most important conversations we are having today. So the stated goal is to challenge the reader to consider the connective tissue that runs between the sciences, philosophy, culture, and art. And I love it. <laughs> this is kind of exactly what I'm interested in, are those connective tissues between the ways that we find meaning in life. So much fascinating scientific work is being done on how animals have learned to navigate the changing world's behavioral demands. There was just recently a, gosh, it was on Netflix, I don't remember, um, about the last year in the natural world and what sort of came alive when humans kind of shut down for a bit. Um, it, was, it was beautiful. And of course, now we've gone back to kind of a lot of driving and a lot of the same things we were doing 16 months ago, so it's probably changing the animal's behavior again. But there's less information that's dedicated to how humans are adapting, how our language and imagination is corroding or evolving, and how a deficit of a shared story in our interaction with the natural world affects our ability to express. It's what Bill just said, it's hard to observe our own bubble. So it's hard to observe ourselves while we're in it. It's hard to talk through something while we're in it. This is the way of paradox and contradiction. But recently there was an article on the kind of unabashed playfulness and joy of the humpback whale who flings its giant body up out of the ocean and then smacks back down onto the surface of the ocean. And there's all these suggestions about why. Maybe to get the barnacles and clinging things off of its body after it's completed its long migration. Maybe it's just playing. So there's not a huge evolutionary reason for play. Why does almost every creature in every species play? 
This is one thing we know that we share with most species, humans. We share play. You watch two dogs rolling around in the litter, and they're just playing. You watch elephants playing with each other, kind of ramming their heads into <laughs> each other, and it's play. There isn't an evolutionary reason that we know of. But it is actually the root of language and ritual. So I'm kind of playing with this idea, I guess, of what if we could see spiritual practice like play? You know, a lot of times we go to this and we go, it's so serious, and I don't know how to make myself so serious. But if we can just kind of let go and maybe play with it a little bit more, it allows us to find freedom and ease. So some have called play and pleasure, as I said, completely pointless to species evolution. But then we also know that it has neurological benefits. It helps kids understand the, understand the rules of engagement. It helps us to understand social cues. It allows us to relate to ourselves even. If we can be playful in our spiritual practice as the kind of non-critical inner observer. If we can just kind of go, oh, ha, huh, I didn't know that before. It's more playful than, dang it, why didn't I get that? Right, being hard on ourselves. So our evolution is not just about our physical adaptation, but about our spiritual becoming as well. It's, again, really hard to talk about that as we're going through it. When you first introduced me to Jim Finley, one of the things that just blew me away about him was his laugh. He has the yeah. best laugh. Yeah. He's a Buddhist psychologist. Yeah. Um, and even though he, in this book that I listened to, Transforming Trauma, is that the name of it? Yeah. Is, it's, it's an incredible book that he does with a woman who's a medical psychic, kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, he was talking about really serious things, childhood trauma, um, you know, kind of going into this. But he had this lightness <clears throat> about him, this ability to just sort of go, and this, too, was part of the experience. I love this story he tells about a young mother that he mentored who was struggling to find time for her own quiet practice. So no matter how early she woke up, it seemed like her children had this honing device on her that as soon as she woke up, they would just come crashing into her space and, Mommy, you know, they're ready to start the day. So she'd wake up earlier thinking, well, if I wake up earlier, they won't wake up this early. But inevitably, the kids kept waking up whenever she first got up. Jim Finley hears this story and he laughs <laughs> and says, okay, 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 let's, let's play a game. You're you and I'm God. And just as soon as you settle in for a little quiet sit, I come scrambling into your room, tumble into your lap in the form of your children. That's how badly I want to be with you. It's playful. So this is the second cat to let out of the bag. When we're present to what is, we're present to sacred mystery. Present to play is being sacred. Ah, present to sacred mystery. There is a there is a series on National Geographic, uh, which we access through Disney Plus, a five series program on whales, mm. and oh, it was wonderful. They're incredible. They are really incredible social animals, mm -hmm. and some of them live a long time. That's really wonderful. So I get made fun of, um, both to my face and behind my back. I know it. I know it. I know this happens because of the frequency with which I mention the importance of having a daily <laughs> spiritual practice to the point of people go, ah. Yeah. So my interest in and a search for a pragmatically useful spiritual practice began before I knew what most of the words in the sentence I just said meant. You know, we all believe that the family that we um, come into the world and are put in is normal. It's what shapes our formative years. <laughs> and um, my family that I grew up in, my nuclear family, had all the outward appearances of acceptability. Um, there was no physical abuse. There was no alcoholism. There was no infidelity, at least in the immediate family. As I got to be uh, more aware of doing a genogram and how 
my extended family was, I began to realize, boy, there were a lot of deep, dark secrets mm -hmm. in the family mm -hmm. that I grew up in. Now, my beautiful bride, Dr. Sherry Beeman, contributed a, a phrase to me years ago that I just, wow, that makes so much sense. She said, children are like vacuum cleaners. Mm. They suck up everything. They don't miss anything. And I didn't miss any of the secrets that <laughs> were going on. I didn't know what they were. Yeah. It took me decades to find out about that. But now as somebody who's trained in psychology, if I saw a family come to me and they had a 10-year-old child that was reading the kind of books I was reading when I was 10 years old, I would say there's something wrong with this picture. Because folks, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I was reading Paul Tiller. I wasn't, just for the record. <laughs> That's not bragging. That's not bragging. I was, I was searching for something, and mm -hmm. so are you. Mm -hmm. you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here right now. We're all looking for something, hoping for something. It, it gets us here. My uh, f mother and father bought, both taught Sunday school in the Southern Baptist Church where we went in Columbia, Tennessee. It was a benignly fundamentalist church, but it was fundamentalist and racist. And I'm sure that friends of theirs went to the bookstore in Nashville, religious bookstore, and said, I need a gift for my Sunday school teacher. And some clerk handed them books, and my father and mother brought them home. Although my father once wanted to be a school teacher in, in his youth, I never saw him read a book. Hmm. But I read them, and, and uh, because I was, I, I was uh, looked something. So whereas my friends were reading comic books, I was reading Paul Tillich. Hmm. And um, the value that background has been to me is immeasurable. It put me on a path to learn so much, both from the fields of psychology and spirituality that has been so valuable to me. I still, from time to time, go back and read a sermon entitled You Are Accepted, that appears as chapter 19 in a book of sermons of Paul Tillich that was published in 1948, but probably found its way into our home in the mid-early 50s, somewhere like that. Now, you can go online this afternoon and put in your Google search, Paul Tillich's sermon, You Are Accepted, and you can read it. And I promise you, you will read some of the most powerful paragraphs that have ever been written in spiritual language. You are accepted as the title of that sermon. It was like discovering a pearl of great price when mm -hmm. I found it. So as we go forward, because we are all searching for something, not every Sunday, but episodically, as I said, I want Holly and me to offer you some practices that you can use on this pathless path to wholeness and freedom and love. Um, what I was looking for as a child was what I call peace of mind. I was anxious. There was a lot of anxiety in my family system. I now understand a lot about why that was. Um, but I, it, it was like the breaking of a shell for me when I heard, am I getting ahead? No, I just forgot that slide. That's my kids playing and a dog playing. <laughs> it was like breaking a shell when I first heard Richard Roy say these words that you see. When it comes to peace of mind, I've never met anyone who was in their mind who was at peace. <laughs> and I've never met anyone who was at peace who was in their mind. This is the value of spiritual practice. And, and one of the things that you will discover when you take up the first aspect of spiritual practice is how much you are in your mind, how addicted we are to thinking, and how guided we are by the thoughts that we have. Give it a go and see if I'm not telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. Paradox and contradiction. Life is difficult. 
and learning how to manage the difficulties of life and still have the peace, love, and joy, the patience and humility that we hope for, is one of the results of good spiritual practice. It's what I hope that we can teach and share and contribute to the world out there. And when you meet somebody who has gotten further down the pathless path than we are mm-hmm. about doing this, what you notice is how friggin' happy they are <laughs> all the time, laughing and unflappable, apparently. And um, this is what I like about Jim Finley. Yeah. It's, it's, it's this cackle of a laugh all the time. He's the most abusive background you can imagine. His father was a physically abusive raging alcoholic and what that caused Jim Finley to do was to run away from home when he was 17 where did he go he went to Gethsemane Monastery and got Thomas Merton to be his spiritual director yeah but he couldn't see what was happening in his bubble when it was happening so in this way his spiritual practice has served as a way to see what was? This is not my notes, but i got to tell you this story. So uh, <laughs> Finley is in the monastery, mm-hmm. and he's reading um, uh, Teresa of Avila's Castles to yes. Nowhere, or whatever they call it, Castles on the Way to the Kingdom. And there's seven of them. Watch your mic. Hmm? Watch your mic. You're putting your hands Okay. There's seven of them. <laughs> and he takes this book for one of his third or fourth visits with Thomas Merton. And he says to Thomas Merton, "Um, I think I am in Castle 4, but I may be in only Castle 3. You can tell me. I can take it. (laughs) And Thomas Merton looked at Jim Finley and said, Jim, it's none of your damn business where you are. Go feed the pigs. And come to me every week and tell me your experience, your spiritual experience of feeding the pigs. I love that story. That's funny. Okay. So there's nothing you can do to achieve peace, love, joy, patience, humility. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing you can do. And the paradox is that once you realize that you are inherently these things, then there's probably a lot that you will be busy doing. Mm. Hmm. So I wanted to go back a little bit to language and how it helps us engage with paradox and contradiction. Language is a symbolic meaning system. That's all it is. And as I said, it helps us share our experiences to narrate them. Stories are one of the things that seem to be unique to humans, that we can pass them down from generation to generation. We don't know of other species that can tell stories. I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm just saying we don't know. But they do pass behaviors down. But our way of passing knowledge down is through stories and art. Human language has uh, preserves tales from thousands and thousands of years ago. Some of the ancient Hebrew scriptures, for example, were written as early as 12,000 BC. But they often were retained and shared verbally. So the the way that they were passed down was verbal. And they were passed down through song and mnemonics. So song, we can remember rhythms easier than we can remember facts. And mnemonics are ways of, can you think of a mnemonic right off the top of your head right now? A way of remembering, uh, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, is um, the way that you remember the order of operations in math. Parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide. Add, subtract, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. You got that, Calista? Yeah. Two weeks, test, OK? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> in order for hearers to remember these stories, they had, again, to be rhythmic, simple, and repetitive. If we read scripture literally, we're left with this very binary impression of God. God made day and night, easy to remember. God made male and female, easy to remember. God separated sky from water, easy to remember. And they all start with God made, God made, God created. These are easy, repetitive things to remember. God gathered up waters and let dry land appear. You see where I'm going. But to really appreciate language, if you're a jazz fan, I'm a huge jazz fan. In fact, my middle son's name is Cole, in part for Coltrane. And just like with jazz, you get the fullness of the music when you are listening to the spaces between the notes. 
Language is like that too. When we hear the spaces in between male and female, there's a whole vast range. God made day and night and everything in between. You know that moment just before the sun sets, and that just before it dips below the horizon, it's not night, it's not day, it's almost dark, but it's not quite white. <laughs> That's not day or night. So there's this whole range in between the words. And male and female, all of us have male and female qualities. We're not just one thing. And then not to mention those who identify as non-binary and transgender. They're included in that. It's not so binary. They're not outside of that. If water's separate from sky, how come the clouds in the sky make rain? It's not separate. So God made the sun and moon, and almost as a footnote in Genesis, it says, oh, and also the stars. But there's so much more than just the sun and the moon and the universe. There's planets, there's asteroids, there's black holes. My kid just taught me about white holes. Any, did anyone know white holes exist? It's the other side of a black hole where something gets pulled through and maybe creates something else. Every binary has infinite possibilities between what is and what the next thing is. Between male and female, there's an infinite possibility. So these, you know, in my own household, even, there are, you know, we say, like, I'm in an interracial marriage. My husband is black. I'm white. But there are so many shades of skin between that. My, all of my kids have different shades of skin. They're not just black or just white. You know, so, so it's not a binary. If we increase our field of vision and look for these spaces in between, our spiritual practice is increasing how we see, right? There's just so much. So even this phrase, God made, is a metaphor. And I think God is just the word we have that's the most helpful one we can understand for sacred mystery, for that which we don't yet understand. And this understanding that we're gaining of deep time evolution is continually expanding. And so in my mind, our knowledge of God, of what is sacred, should do the same, should keep expanding, not rely on the binaries. When we read between the lines, we lean into those spaces. Uh, Kabir, the mystic poet, wrote, God is the breath inside the breath inside the breath. When we find that space, that's where mystery and growth is. So our ego wants us to see in dualisms, black, white, male, female. It's helpful to label our world around us in some ways. Stop sign doesn't mean go. These things can be helpful. But our spirit, our true self, she's, sees all those shades of gray, gray in between. It's available to all of us. And this is the third cat to let out of the bag. Not a single one of us is binary. We are all more than one thing. Meister Eckhart wrote, if you could see who you really are for only a moment, you would see your life and all life, pure being, nobility and givenness, perfection. You would never then turn away again. So uh, those of you who are interested in Meister Eckhart and want a really accessible, wonderful door to go into his work, there's a little book called Meister Eckhart's Book of Secrets Then mm -hmm. we're going to base in two weeks mo much of what we'll say on the <laughs> on a passage yeah. from, from that book. Meister Eckhart is wonderful. It was Cynthia Bergeau who was the first person I ever heard. I think she coined the phrase egoic operating system. You know, like your computer has an operating system and you sometimes have to upgrade it. Well, we all have this egoic operating system. And spiritual practice is designed to destabilize the egoic operating system, to kind of knock it off balance. Like the first thing that, that my first spiritual teacher said to me was, um, my job is to knock you off the path and your job is to get back home. That's where you learn. Okay. If you like that kind of abuse. <laughs> So this cleaning up, growing up, showing up, waking up is not something that's once and for all. We do it on a regular basis. Always we begin again. Mm -hmm. And because we have not, as, a, as an organized religion, been teaching this, we have developed people who are angry and short-sighted. I mean, it's crazy to think that somebody could walk out of a mosque with a desire to blow people up 
or out of a church with the desire to do that. Just crazy. How does how does that come to be? So the, the, the egoic mind sees everything through its own private needs and angers. And we put ourselves at the center, our hurts, our needs, our perspectives. And so with the contemplative mind, we work to empty that egoic mind and fill the heart with something else. Believing in Jesus has been substituted for the faith of Jesus. Faith in Jesus is not the same as the faith of Jesus. Now, Jesus used stories to transform lives. And I want to share with you one of my favorite teaching stories of all time. It's by a man named Terry Dobson. He was the first Aikido master trained in Japan. He's deceased now, but this is his story. The train clanked and rattled through the suburbs of, suburbs of Tokyo on a drowsy spring afternoon. Our car was comparatively empty, a few housewives with their kids in tow, some old folks going shopping. I gazed absently at the drab houses and dusty hedgerows going by. At one station, the doors opened, and suddenly the afternoon quiet was shattered by a man bellowing violent, incomprehensible curses. The man staggered into our car. He wore labor's clothing. He was big, drunk, and dirty. Screaming, he swung at a woman holding a baby. The blow sent her spinning into the laps of an elderly couple. It was a miracle the baby was unharmed. Terrified, the couple jumped up and scrambled toward the other end of the car. The laborer aimed a kick at the retreating back of the old woman, but missed to scuttle to safety. This so enraged the drunk that he grabbed the metal pole in the center of the car and tried to wrench it out of its stanchion. I could see that one of his hands was cut and bleeding. The train lurched ahead, the passengers frozen with fear. I stood up. I was young then, some 20 years ago, and in pretty good shape. I had been putting in a solid eight hours of Aikido training nearly every day for the past three years. I liked to throw and grapple, and I thought I was tough. Tough. The problem was my, my martial skill was untested in actual combat. As students of Aikido, we were not allowed to fight. Aikido, my teacher had said again and again, is the art of reconciliation. Whoever has the mind to fight has broken his connection to the universe. If you try to dominate people, you're already defeated. We study how to resolve conflict not how to start it. I listened to his words. I tried hard. I even went so far as to cross the street to avoid the pinball punks who lounged around the train stations. My forbearance exalted me. <laughs> I felt both tough and holy. In my heart, however, I wanted an absolutely legitimate opportunity whereby I might save the innocent by destroying the guilty. This is it, I said to myself. I got to my feet. People are in danger. If I don't see something fast, somebody's probably going to get hurt. Seeing me stand up, the drunk recognized a chance to focus his rage. Aha, he roared. A foreigner. You need a lesson in Japanese manners. I held on lightly to the commuter, commuter strap overhead and gave him a slow look of disgust and dismissal. I plan to take this turkey apart. <laughs> but he had to make the first move. I wanted him mad. So I pursed my lips and threw him an insolent kiss. <laughs> All right, he hollered, you're going to get a lesson. He gathered himself for a rush at me. A fraction of a second before he could move, someone shouted, hey. It was ear splitting. I remember the strangely joyous, lilting quality of it, as though you and a friend had been searching diligently for something, and he had just stumbled on it. Hey! I wheeled to my left, the drunk to his right. We both stared down at a little old Japanese man. He must have been well into his 70s. This tiny gentleman, sitting there immaculate in his kimono, he took no notice of me, but he beamed delightedly at the laborer as though he had the most important, most welcome secret to share. Come here. 
the old man said in an easy vernacular, beckoning the drunk. Come here. Talk with me. He waved his hand lightly. The big man followed as if on a string. He planted his feet belligerently in front of the old gentleman and roared above the clacking wheels, Why the hell should I talk with you? The drunk now had his back to me. If his elbow moved as much as a millimeter, I would drop him in his socks. The old man continued to beam at the laborer. What you been drinking? I've been drinking sake, the laborer bellowed back, and it's none of your damn business. Flex of spittle splattered the old man. Oh, that's wonderful, the old man said. Absolutely wonderful. You see, I love sake, too. Every night, me and my wife, she's 76, you know. We warm up a little body of sake and take it out in the garden. We sit on an old wooden bench. We watch the sun go down, and we look to see how our permissive, permissive persimmon tree is doing. My great-grandfather planted that tree, and we worry about whether it will recover from the ice storms we had last winter. Our tree's done better than expected, though, especially when you consider the poor quality of the soil. But it's gratifying when we take our sake and go and enjoy the evening, even when it rains. He looked up at the laborer, eyes twinkling. As he struggled to follow the old man's conversation, the drunk's face began to soften. His fist slowly unclenched. Yeah, he said, I love persimmons too. His voice trailed off. Yes, said the old man, and I'm sure you have a wonderful wife. No, replied the laborer, my wife died. Very gently swaying with the motion of the train, the big man began to sob. I don't got no wife. I don't got no home. I don't got no job. I'm so ashamed of myself. Tears rolled down his cheeks. A spasm of despair rippled through his body. Now it was my turn. Standing there in my well-scrubbed youthful innocence, my make this world safe for democracy righteousness, I felt dirtier than he was. The train arrived at my stop. As the doors opened, I heard the old man cluck sympathetically. My, my, that's a difficult predicament. Come, sit down here and tell me about it. Mm -hmm. I turned my head for one last look. The laborer was sprawled on the seat, his head in the old man's lap. The old man was softly stroking the filthy matted hair. As the train pulled away, I sat down on a bench. What I'd wanted to do with muscle had been accomplished with kind words. I'd just seen Aikido tried in combat, and the essence of it was love. I would have to practice the art with an entirely different spirit. It would be a long time before I could speak about the resolution of conflicts. Mm. Spiritual practice is not what you think it is. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step, and we'll see you here next Sunday with Jim Bankston. Yeah.